Just come in, they'll just come on in and we'll pick it up. And let me shut the door. Yeah, you got lunch back there today. Got lunch? Yeah, but uh -huh. serving corned beef and cabbage. Oh boy. Okay, well maybe some people will. $2, that's pretty cheap. Maybe some people will. Come on. It's a 12 o'clock, so yeah. we can miss it. Yeah, I, I can come to this restaurant. I can go buy well, it. Well, look at this, this is food too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, well anyway, um, welcome everybody, and uh, I really want more and more, I've been wanting to, um, for my own personal journey, and, and for what I share, is, is to get more into the understanding of Jesus and the Christian tradition in the context of the Buddha Dharma that we've been looking at, uh, because, um, so this is what I'm constantly discovering myself is how these, how, how to make these uh, uh, two traditions, uh, my tradition, not for the Olympic, well it's over here, you know, like I want to bring these two together in my everyday life. In other words, how to make it uh, living, which means in my life, and how to apply the teaching uh, to my life. Which is always um, th this is not a, 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 a trying to do it. It's more like allowing it to happen, so that I'm constantly discovering how these come together. So, uh, <coughs> so coming here today, <laughs> I oh you know I, I, um, I had an idea what I wanted to bring you know but. Um, I was talking to Errol, and if you notice, when you come up 280, 288, and you're going to turn off on Midlothian, uh, if, you, if you're doping off, there is a turn prior to Midlothian that looks like Midlothian. I don't know where it goes to. It goes to some residential area. But if you, uh, you know, if you leave uh, Poa, you know, if you leave that intersection, and you're coming up 288, uh, expecting to turn onto Midlothian, and you're in a conversation, or doping off, at least I do, <laughs> I will turn on there, and then I'm going along, thinking I'm going to Midlothian, and I say, wait a minute, where in the hell am I? <laughs> this isn't Midlothian. <laughs> and then you gotta turn around, and go back out, and then, oh, I see what I did, I turned that, you know, so. So anyway, uh, so today, again, we're coming up here and we're in talking in the car. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm turning into that, 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 that premature turn off, you know. But immediately I caught it and was able to stop at the, before I got into it, and I could look and see that there was a, you know, an opening, you know, there was no cars coming, get back, um, and I laughed. <laughs> so that's the very, you know, that's something we do all the time. We go into a, we, in our house, we go into another room in the house, so wait a minute, what was I coming, <laughs> what was I coming in here for? Too you know? many times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's happening as we get older, it's funnier, because it happens more often. But what, what, what I wanted to <laughs> look at here, well, exactly what is going on here? And how, how is this um, a little metaphor of, of the practice we're doing, you know, in a larger thing? And basically, it is a, a moment where you, uh, are, you, you awake from <clears throat> a dream. In other words, if I'm in the car and I'm talking to my friend, I am in that conversation and only you know one eye is driving the car or maybe i don't know who's driving the car <laughs> but i'm in the conversation right so i'm not really present the, the road is present i mean this is the present this is the now the road driving the car or wherever we are is the present moment but the mind will create an alternative reality that is infinitely more interesting. And it could be just doping off, daydreaming, or conversation, or suddenly thinking about, oh, I gotta go visit the store, 
or I left this at home, or whatever. But as soon as the mind does that, it disconnects us from the present moment, and we're off, and we miss our turn. You know, because we're just, you know, or we don't know, what, why did I come in here? You know, so, <laughs> you know, because, uh, uh, so anyway, these, these are basically little um, mini dramas of the practice of being present. So like when we're sitting for meditation or doing yoga nidra, or just listening to the talk here, uh, the mind will find infinite ways uh, to take off on something more interesting. You know, it's very hard for the mind to stay focused on the present moment. Because the me, the thinker, uh, wants to keep thinking, like lives in thinking. You know, the, in order to be present and just being aware of now, you can't be thinking about something else. You know, so that this, um, so usually it takes something very exciting to keep us focused on the present moment, because otherwise the mind will, this is not interesting, or I'm bored, or I've got something more interesting to do, and it's off, you see, we're no longer present. So even, you know, in our daily life, we're constantly being present, and then constantly going off. So we're just talking to somebody, you know, uh, or maybe I'm sitting at the breakfast table with my wife, and she's got a, a crossword puzzle that she wants to, that we're working together, you know, and, and I suddenly find it rather dull, so I'm <laughs> drift, what, what was the word? <laughs> oh yeah, well, okay, you know, in other words, I'm disengaged, you know, uh, because it's not powerful enough to keep me focused, you know, but if she was angry at me, I'd be really right there. <laughs> you, know, you know, so this, we, we experience this all the time, you know. Uh, so I thought that was funny this morning, because, uh, um, uh, it was just, just in other words, we, we the whole the whole Dharma practice is is having the attention to wake up, or to be present, to show up for life, to show up for the present moment, and not be drifting off into alternative realities of the past or the future, but to be here now, as Ram Das used to say, be here now. You see, so this so. Um, it's kind of like a um, game between uh, sleeping and waking up. So it really doesn't matter what we're sleeping, what we're sleeping about or dreaming about, whether I'm dreaming, thinking about going here or going there, or I wish I was in a different place, or daydreaming, or just taking a nap because we're just too bored with the moment. You know, it doesn't make any difference what the conditions are, the, 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 the value is uh, remembering presence. Like when I was driving the car, suddenly I remembered being present and I saw where I was and stopped. You know, so I stopped the dream, the, the daydreaming or the whatever I was in from going, you know, going all the way and making the wrong turn. You know, so I caught myself which is like meditation when you're just sitting there, I'm going to just be present with my breath, and then thinking will come in and say uh, uh, yada, 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 and then you go off on it, and then, oh, breath, and you come back to breath, and that holds for five or six, ten seconds or whatever, and then the next thinking comes in, yada, 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 oh, breath, you come back to breath. So the whole practice is not the fault for doping off, the practice is in the remembering. But in order to remember, you have to have something to forget. You see? In other words, there has to be some dream or forgetting in order to remember, to be present, to wake up and say, wait, wait a minute, where am I? Or what am I doing here? You know, or just being present. And by being present, we're talking about just eating a strawberry. Now, the other morning, come in, come in. It's all right. So I'm sitting at breakfast the other morning, and, and uh, uh, oh no, my wife was gone, and she left a bowl of cereal, and uh, a couple of big strawberries, and a half a banana. So I had to cut them up to put them on the cereal. So uh, no distractions. Uh, 
The dog had died, so that was the problem. <laughs> and so I'm cutting up, I'm slicing the, the strawberry. You know, and I'm watching the strawberry uh, open itself up and begin to just kind of bleed this juice, you know, and it was, uh, 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 then I just sliced it until there was no more strawberry. You know, in other words, here's the strawberry, and then you slice it and quarter it and put it, then you have pieces of strawberry. I did the same with the banana. And then you uh, eat the strawberry and you taste the strawberry, you're conscious of the strawberry. Uh, and then the strawberry is gone, you know. But I was just, uh, because I was by myself, I was just very present with cutting up the strawberry and eating the strawberry, tasting, instead of just eating the thing and thinking about what I'm going to do next, you see, which is what we usually do, you know, we just, we just, it's automatic, we just cut it up and eat it and what, the whole time we're gone. We're thinking about uh, a TV show or what we're going to do or what somebody said to me or what I should, you know, whatever. You know, we're gone. And we just automatically just eat the strawberry. We never really see and feel and taste the strawberry, you know. So that, um, so it's that kind of a remembrance. So when you wash the dishes, to just watch, watch the, 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 uh, dishwashing process, you know, with the water and the foam and the soap and the sounds of it and maybe the clinking of the dishes, you know, the whole sensory experience, you know, of washing the dishes is being, is showing up for life. You know, and so it's that kind of uh, remembrance that we're talking about of showing up for life, you see. Um, so I'm thinking right now of the, the communion, particularly in a uh, the, my mother went to the uh, Presbyterian church, and so I used to go over there sometimes. Um, and they would have communion maybe once a month or something. But anyway, in front of the altar, there's a big table there with a thing, uh, in remembrance of me. You know, that's pretty much in every church, the whole idea of remembering something. So I'm um, saying, so, well, just what are we supposed to be remembering? <laughs> so then I got the... Uh, the other day, uh, uh, I was, uh, <clears throat> there's a little bookshelf above my bed, and so uh, I was, had meditated, but I was still wide awake. So I just reached up there on the shelf and grabbed the book, and I just pulled this one down here. It was The Third Jesus by Deepak Chopra. And I may have, uh, I must have read it because I got, <laughs> that, you know, under magic, you know, uh, yellow markers in it. You know, usually if I read a book, there'll be some of those in it. So I started reading it again, and it just really uh, kind of like hit me where, you know, it kind of like brought the whole thing of what we've been, what I've been uh, working with and trying to uh, bring together the uh, Dharma practice of remembering to be present and the remembrance of me that you see in the churches, where you see, which is, a, you know, about remember, remember Jesus or remember whatever that means, you know. So how do we bring these together? And uh, so this is what I just, when I came in here this morning, I put this up here. And, and just to give us a basic, the basic problem with, with uh, uh, Christianity and the way it presents uh, remembrance is that uh, if you want to go back to the uh, uh, study of Christianity from its birth with St. Paul and the Roman Catholic Church and the, the uh, creation of the creed and the doctrine and uh, what's in the Bible and what isn't in the Bible and all the uh, metaphysical and theological uh, philosophical debates over this for thousands of years. Uh, it, it basically goes down to who is Jesus and you get two fundamental uh, definitions. One of them is that Jesus was a human being who lived in Galilee and he was a, um, at that time for the, in the, his religion, he was a rabbi, you know, a spiritual teacher. And he lived and he uh, had an uh, unknown life until he was 30 and he taught for three years and then he was killed 
and that was it as far as the and, and uh, his, his his disciples copied down what he said and put it in a book. And so that's the historical thing, you know. So then when when the, the religion is formed, you see, well then Jesus becomes uh, God. So so you've got this fundamental conflict in running through Christianity. Is he man or is he God or is he both? Uh, if he's just man, uh, well then he was a really a good teacher. And that he lived in the past, uh, like Socrates or Jesus or any other, you know, spiritual teacher at the time. Um, you can, you know, read his stuff and study it and go on. Uh, but then in the in the in the religion of it, we'll see then uh, Jesus becomes uh, God and takes on metaphysical qualities, like he's sitting on the right hand of God and he was from the beginning to before Abraham. I you know. He was there, he's in the after, you know, he's waiting for us when we die. And, you know, the whole cosmic picture, you know. So now he's really up there, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, he's God, you know. Or is he uh, somebody I can have a beer with? <laughs> you know, in that sense, you know, uh, you know, he's not God, he's just, you know, just the educated, you know, spiritual philosopher, teacher, you know, so you can have some tea with him, you know. You can't have tea with God. <laughs> you know, see? So there's a real conflict. Is Je the man, Jesus the man is in is a form, a physical form that dies, and it's in time. It was back there in the time. Or God, well, God is has no form. Unless if you give God a form, then it becomes a false idol. You know, so there's a big problem in Christianity about, you know false idols, so this is why they have a big problem with other religion, and particularly with Hinduism, because they have a lot of idols, you know, elephants and stuff like that. So anyway, so the idea of God is this formless, and if there's no form, it's not in time. So then, so you got a real double bind here of uh, of, of definitions, man or God or both. So, what happens is that that um, when you when then when when uh, in the Jesus says I am the way. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I uh, get like Jesus? But then if Jesus is God, well, I can't get like God. Or uh, do I just follow what Jesus did and uh, wear sandals and long hair and, 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 uh, and just, um, you know, go ahead and, and uh, uh, feed lepers? And, and, you know, in other words, <laughs> we don't even know what this means. Um, but what we do end up with is that we that because of the 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 that you can't put these two together at the same time. It's either going to be uh, intellectually. We can't, you know, if it's going to be man, okay, well then I can develop my the way then that I the way that I function in religion is going to be according to uh, he's a teacher and I can just study what he taught like it was a philosophy class or something. Or that would be one way. Or another way would be if Jesus is God, well then I will just be bow to God as Jesus and, and uh, uh, as a savior. And then he'll, then, then by bowing to God, then he'll fix me. Everything will work out. So I don't have to do anything except just be devoted, love, love Jesus with all my heart and mind, you see. So then he'll take, the, he'll, Jesus is the boss. Or Jesus slash God, you see. So now I now I, you know Jesus is the boss. Or is Jesus just another man like me? So, you know, we get we're going to either go one or the other. But but it's but it's impossible intellectually to put them both together. You know, it's like here you, you got this is a, a water, you know, a, a, a 
this is a, a water holder, this is a book, you know, two, op, two different things. I can't make it, <laughs> I can't make them one thing. So we either go one, because if, you see, if, uh, my old thing here, so if, uh, If Jesus is God and man, then you've got two incompatible opposites that are one yet two. And this is illogical. The, the intellect cannot penetrate that. So what we end up with is um, in, in the way Christianity is um, presented, and for the most part practiced, um, particularly in the modern world, is that you have a double binding, you have two commandments that cancel each other out. So what are the two commandments? Well, one is, <clears throat> Well, one of them would be uh, <clears throat> try to love God. In other words, um, try to uh, follow what, you know, if Jesus, uh, I don't know, a couple of things I wanted to read here. But this, this idea here is try to love God. Well, this is, this is a double binding commandment that cancels each other out. One of them is try. Hello. Good morning. Okay, this and you could you could change this here. Uh, this could be uh, a parent's commandment to the child. Try to be good today. Parents are saying, you know, you know, you're going out with the kid. You try to be good. <laughs> All right. Well, that puts the kid in the double bind. Now, how does this double bind work? Well, first of all, an authority, parent or the church, says, number one, try. All right. Two, love. Now the double bind is that love is that's about spontaneous. Spontaneous. That is right. <laughs> is it always spontaneous? I'm too close to it. O-U-S. O-U-S. Okay. Spontaneous? Spontaneous. <laughs> N-E-O-U-S. -E -O -U -S. Forget it. <laughs> I don't want to get, I'm losing my thought. In other words, spontaneous, in other words, love is spontaneous. I mean, you can't try to love. If you, you know, love, love is not something you can control. So basically this is saying try put out effort, will to love, you see. So how can I will love without being A hypocrite. <laughs> a hypocrite is somebody who 
pretends or believes they're doing something that they're really not feeling. So this whole idea here, you see, so this, the, these, are, these are what I would call double binding commandments that cancel each other out. You know, if I try to love, I cancel out love. But I have to do both. You see, I'm commanded by the authority, which might be the church or the Bible or God or Jesus or whatever, uh, to, do, to fulfill these two commandments, try and love, and you have to do them both at the same time, but it's impossible to do both at the same time. So it creates the, un the our inability to understand this creates hypocrisy, which is the very thing the, <laughs> the Bible, particularly the, the uh, Hebrew prophets, were always uh, yelling at Israel for being, you know, the, the hypocrites, you know, oh, you hypocrites, you know, the hypocrites this, the hypocrites that, you know. So this little, most of the Bible is about pointing out hypocrisy as, as, the, uh, as, as uh, a sin. So what this really creates, so what, when you get a, a mind that is ordered to do a commandment by God or parents or authority, but the commandment is self-conflicting so you can't do it, it creates a neurosis. Now, a, a, a neurosis, a, I'm not a psychologist, but a neurosis is a, is a mind that's divided against itself, and it can't, no matter what it does, it can't get out. It's called a, du a double bind. It is where you have um, two commandments or two orders uh, that must be fulfilled, and each one cancels out the other one. So if you choose, it's either or, you know, like, like uh, all the romantic stories are about double bonds, where the girl has two men, and she either or, which one is she going to choose? Oh, this one has, oh, you know, so many qualities, you know, but then this one has all these things, you know, and so one minute she's going with this one, and then oh, the other one she's got back to this one, you know. And she can't get out of the double bind because each one has value. And so finally, the, the movie is resolved when she chooses one. Or, you know, something happens, oh, you know, this is the one. You know, so, but that would be love happened. She, she couldn't choose it. You see, choice is not the way. So if, in other words, you can't choose <laughs> your way out of the double bind, which is the human mind, you know, the, the worldly or normal human mind that we all live in is constantly caught in double binds where you've got these choices and it could be small or big, you know. Should I say this or should I say that? Should I buy this cereal or that cereal? Uh, should I go to Cleveland or should I go to California? You know, or um, should I go get some coffee or tea? <laughs> you, you just burst in my bubble because I thought that I was living by the fact that life is choices. You make choices you know yeah. that way. Well, it is, but at the same time, there. The, so we're looking, what we're looking for here is, is that Jesus, we're assuming that what Jesus said is the truth. <laughs> and he says, I am the way. Um, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> See, so we, we, just, we just can't assume we know what this means. Because in our everyday life, if we're caught in double bond, we, you know, not, not, this is what Buddha calls suffering. You know, life is suffering. Life is a double bind. <laughs> it, you, can't, the only, you can't get out of life. The only way out of life is death. <laughs> the only way to escape life is, is death. But, but that, we'll get to that later. But this whole idea here is that, is that, all right, take a, take a look at our, 
the evolution of our consciousness. Okay, we start out with uh, a baby. Innocence, okay? No double bind. Babies are not in double bind. Unless you, you know, in other words, they, they, uh, they just do what they want to do. They don't say, uh, should, I, should I have this nipple or that nipple? You know, they don't. <laughs> You know, or, or you know, should I do this? There is no choice for a baby. They'll just pick. They'll just do something. There's no deliberation. You see. So this is, you know, so if Jesus says uh, you can't get into the kingdom of heaven unless you come as a little child. You see, we may be looking back to that, which would be a state that was pre-choice. But then, here we go. We're we're. Uh, You know, little baby, and then next thing you know, uh, we're uh, in the world, and and the world now offers us choices. Parents tell us, "What you know? Not now we're in the world. You're talking about those choices." And um, choice, and then we're told that we we have to choose. We're the, you have you have to choose. You have to choose. Uh, you know, so it's always in you see uh, you know, so we're always confronted every moment is kind of like a choice, you know and where this Normally it works out okay, but where it becomes a neurosis, either temporary or permanent, is when they double bind. <laughs> but it's nice. Uh, yeah, you know, in other words, you choose one or the other but you keep finding yourself back with another choice. You, you never get home. <laughs> you know, so you just cre keep creating more choices, and the illusion is that if I keep choosing, if I choose better, I can get out of it. But the, the truth is, and we begin to discover this as we get older, you know, that we're constantly being tape looped back into another Hey, this is a this is a painful situation here, because when the the um, the commandment of life is that is that life is one. You know that that uh, that life, reality, the whole cosmos is one. It's not two. And there's only one life. There's not two lives. You know, there's many lives. But all life is really one life, you see. And the cosmos, there are all many pieces of the cosmos. There's a desk, and there's this, and this, and this. But there's only one cosmos. It's not like there's two separate universes. So it's really many, one, and many. But, but the commandment of life is to find The one. So this is this is kind of like the 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 evolutionary drive of our lives is to find the one. The, the you know it starts out with uh, my mate, but you know Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you know the one person for me, or um, the one career for me, or um, whatever the one is. It feels like home. The one place for me. You know, I remember in 1986 or seven, I'd been struggling to get out of Blackstone for a few years since I moved there. And when I got a job with the Courier Record writing about the town, uh, for the first time I felt like Blackstone was my home because I could write about it. It was, it was the 
source of my creativity. I was writing stories about the people, and that that made me feel for the first time in my life that I had a hometown. You know, I didn't. I no longer thought of where I was going to go next. And that, you know, I was keeping my suitcase packed is the way I lived. <laughs> this is temporary. You know. uh, so this was the first time, you know, that. Uh, and with my wife, you know, so there was many times I struggled to get out of the relationship, but at the same time, there was a realization that this relationship was home. You know, when I had to, any double binds that I found in the relationship, I had to solve in the relationship and not by going to a better relationship. See, double binds are painful. And when we get at them, we want, to, we want to get out of the pain because we have to be one. In other words, one means one self. Okay? We all want to be one self, not two selves. But when we have a choice, we're two. In other words, we, we, the way we feel about a choice is, is that if I choose this, or I choose that, I will be my complete self in whichever one I can choose. You see, in other words, if I choose this, I will be one and at peace with my whole. Or if I choose this, I'll be one. So we're always trying to choose the path to one and to get out of the pain of two. It's very subtle. This is kind of like at the root, you know, if you choose a car, you know, if I choose this car, I'll be happy, but they're both valuable and they both got the pros and the cons, you see. But what I want to choose is the one choice that will remove the pain of choice. See, the choice... Can you ever choose both sides? Choose to see it both ways? Well, um, if you're choosing a product, no, you can't, you have to choose one or the other. Unless you, you know, unless you buy them both. Yeah, but if you see life, see, see the things that are going on in life, see, choose both ways because everybody's different. Yes, yes, we, yes. If, yeah, I think you're pointing at the way we want to go. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's follow that. But, you know, it's, you know the, the fact is that you can't, we're in the world, we're in a mind, and we can't get out of cho choosing. I'm not saying that you can live without choosing. Uh, every, I mean, every, you know, just what, am I going to have uh, strawberries or a banana, you know? <laughs> you know, what do you want, you see, you know? Um, you know, it's very, very minute, you know, should I walk to this side of the room or go over there, you know? It's, it's kind of, or are there big choices? You know, or are there, you know, life-determining choices, you know? You know, should I, should I uh, tell on this person or not, you know? And all, you know, what will happen, you know, all these things. Uh, but I think what, I, what we're looking at here is that the root of it is that we want to be one, and when we are one, we feel at home in ourself, or comfortable in my skin. I'm okay with myself because I have, I don't feel divided. You see, I'm not being torn apart. You know that the whole image of uh, of um, you know lions tearing apart a zebra. It's like that we feel like the world is tearing us apart. You know. That, that feeling. So that behind it all is, is wanting to be one, which is the feeling of being home, at home in myself. And that can be either conditioned by coming back to the town I grew up with and now I feel at home, where I was in the city and I lived a life in exile, you know, like the, like the Jews in Egypt, you know. I, I, my real home was in Blackstone where I grew up, you know, I'm just imagining, you see, I didn't grow up there, but that whole feeling of coming back home uh, and out of exile or I've been in the diaspora where I've had to go work in the world, you know, and, and make all these bad choices and all this stuff and live in this pain, but I want to get back home, and when I get back home, I feel, oh, you see, I feel whole again, you see, I can rest. That whole, it's all in the stories, it's, you know, it's in our back of our mind, you know, it's in our dreams, you know, where is home? Um, 
So it takes on a physical thing or a spiritual thing. Uh, I want to be with God. Where is God? You see, now this whole uh, th there's so many levels to this, but 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 the basic of it is the feeling of being at home and no longer divided. I can be who I am at home. We're not we're not divided by uh, uh, the conflict of relationship. You know, which were, should I do this or should I sacrifice what I want to do for that person? You know, what, all these little choices, there's just me. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I don't, you know, who cares if I get up or stay in bed? You know, uh, there's, there, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, so there's that, you know, that, that's the, um, in the spiritual paths, you have the monastic tradition where you live in a little cell by yourself or you live in the world in relationship. Um, so, this path is about how to live in the world uh, and be at home in the world. So where are we? Okay, so we're looking for the way and we find that the um, traditional application of the way in which we uh, are given it by traditional religion is conflicted. Or, or creates um, the ongoing kicking the can of the double bind down the road where I'm constantly trying to measure up to an ideal that I can't meet. So, 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 uh, uh, so I'm never at home with myself because I never measure up. If I don't like, you know, if, I, if my body is not the shape of the, what, what my culture dictates, you know, women have this problem uh, tremendously because there is a ideal female shape upon which every girl compares herself and finds herself lacking because the body's always changing. <laughs> the shape stays the same. So my body is always shifting around. It's too thin or too fat. But it, and if it just gets that ideal shape, now I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. <laughs> you see, because it's going to be just here for a few years, you know. And then the next thing you know, I'm putting on the pounds, and I've lost the shape, and now I don't feel at home in my, my body. You know. So this this goes on um, in a lot a lot of the ray anger today in society is that uh, with uh, particularly with uh, uh, working class people. Uh, black and white, uh, when they, um, particularly with men, see if they, when, they, when men lose their power, they're not at home with themselves. And power is the ability to get a job and support a family, you see, and if you can't get a job and support, if you get a job and you can't support a family, or you can't get a job, you know, you've lost power, and so that makes the male uncomfortable or unhappy. He's not at home in himself, you see, and he's angry. Uh, so th there's a lot of dimensions to this. <coughs> so we're, we're investigating the, uh, the fact that the, the double binding commandment that uh, of constant either or choices that, that never get us to one, it always ends up by getting us to, to more twos. See, we never get to one because the, the choices, either or, you know, always, always gets back to another two. Now I've got another choice, you see. So we can never rest. There's no resting because the, the, the um, dynamics of this or the logic of this just keeps us moving to more in different double double binds, taking a, a new shape that we hadn't seen before. So we have to look and understand this as a pattern. Okay. Um, and a pattern. A 
good example is the whirlpool. I brought this up again. But a whirlpool is a pattern in river water or in your tub. When you, you know, when you pull the drain and you get a little whirlpool, okay? Or you look at a stream or a river, you have a whirlpool. Uh, this a whirlpool is created by a double bind of energies. In a whirlpool, you have uh, current energy going this way. There are two opposite energies that meet and go like this. They don't go, the river is energy going this way. A whirlpool is river, is river, you know, energy that gets blocked by maybe a rock or I don't know what conditions. And that energy, instead of all going this way, it splits and goes this way. But it's a pattern. It, the, the, pat, the whirlpool doesn't exist outside of the water. You don't see a whirlpool walking around. So it's not a thing. It's not a noun. It's a pattern of energy. The pattern exists, and it will recreate itself when conditions are right. You can go to the river, and maybe it's a log or something that's causing the whirlpool, and you can straighten that out, and the water will flow again. But the whirlpool will create, will be over there. Maybe there's a flood, something changes, and the next thing you know, you've got a whirlpool. So the pattern recreates itself when conditions are right for it. Is that made by kind of like the when we are evolving as, as a new people? A new person? You know, learning different ways in life? But once it meets that pattern? Yeah, because we're always, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're all, whenever we get caught in a double bind, we want to create our own way to get out of it. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, you. Um, Here's a good double bind. I got bugs in my backyard. I got bugs. So I got a problem. So the, I, I go buy a solution. I get some um, hot shot bug spray. <laughs> and I spray the problem. But then the, the, um, the side effects to the bug spray. Now I got a new problem. Or better example of that is the, is the drug ads. I got a problem with something in my body, right? So I get the drug, but then I take the drug, and now I got new side effects that I may have to take another drug for. <laughs> you know, now I got five drugs where I started out with none, but each one is fixing the problem, the previous one, and then it's so confused, and then you go to the doctor, a new doctor, and he says, what in the hell are you taking? And he throws it all in the trash. <laughs> we'll start over. <laughs> So you get back to you get back to innocence. You get back to where you started, because it got so complicated with each drug trying to solve the double bind of the other drug. You see, so that's a good example. Yeah. This double bind, double bind. Yeah. Uh, so learning how to cope with that is something that we have to learn Stay, but you didn't want to stay. Yes. So sometimes what I'm saying Does is this? getting out is the way. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so if we jump back to this, so if Christianity puts me in a double bind, obviously the way out <laughs> is to drop the whole pattern 
and something new will come along. Now that, that new thing might be Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> You know, there might be God himself. So we're, what we're really digging into this thing, I'm glad you brought that up, because uh, I am the way means what is the way out of the double bind of the either or, where I'm caught between I should do this because God tells me or Jesus or my mother or my boss or husband or whatever tells me I should do this or I think I should do it, but I don't feel like doing it. Yeah. So it's a conflict between thought and body, right. you see, feelings. Body is feelings. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly caught in this choice between should over want. This is the big problem yes. Paul had in Christianity. Why do I want what I shouldn't want, what I don't? <laughs> Why do I do what I shouldn't do? This is the big fault line in Christianity where you have the ideal of what you should be doing to be a good Christian and what you actually feel like doing, but don't act on it. So now you're ashamed. Now you're kind of like turned against yourself. I really want to smack that neighbor, but I'm supposed to kiss him. <laughs> See what I mean? I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but I don't feel, I can't try to be, you know, you, you, we should try to love your neighbor. Right. You should try to love. Uh, you should try to love that person. If you don't, you're a sin. You're going to hell. You're not a good Christian. So yeah, I'll try to do it. So now I'm a hypocrite, and I know I'm a hypocrite. Now I hate myself. <laughs> I can't love myself. You see. So I'm. No matter what I do, you see, you, you're caught. You're. It's like Burr Rabbit on the tar baby. You know what you do. You're stuck in it. You see. So uh, what we're really looking, you know, and this is the way the world turns. To speak of the so proper, this is what the world is. It's not good or bad, it's just the way it is. It doesn't matter if you're in Roman times or Middle Ages or uh, 19 or 1800 or whatever the time is, the world is the same. But we think we're evolved, we think we're, oh wow, well, we're really, you know, but we haven't. As far as the world goes, the world is still the same and we're still asleep in it. We're still making the wrong turn. <laughs> You know, we're still caught up in the, in the neurosis of the split mind trying to get home to where it's not split by making choices, by, by an act of will, you see. So, So this whole idea of the way, now Buddha says I'm the way too. I mean all of, you know, in other words, uh, from, from my practice, uh, I don't, you know, I, uh, the, the way is the same. But it has to be, there, there is no uh, way that's laid down by prescription or the Bible or parents or society, see, because the secular society gives us a way too. I mean, you have to uh, uh, follow your, follow your uh, dream, what you want to be, you have to make the right choices and all these ways. So the, America offers a promised land of uh, success, fame, and prosperity. Uh, religions, religion offers a promised land of uh, peace, um, or the end to the conflict of the world, which for most people it's like when you get to heaven, and that's, you know, you can't have it in the world. Wait till I get to heaven, you know, but, but the, the way that we're looking for is in the world, and not after we die and leave it, you see. So we want to find the way in the world, um, through the either or choices of the whirlpool. Odysseus has a great myth, you know, in the voyage of Odysseus. He had many uh, trials, and one of them was he had to get through Scylla and Charybdis. If you remember your Greek mythology, and Charybdis was a whirlpool 
I forgot, Scylla was a whirlpool and Charybdis was a uh, big dragon with many heads and it would snatch you off the ship. So we had to get through this, between these two opposites, both of which were with engine, you know, so we had to, you know, and even in the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, Moses, when he leads the Hebrews out of Egypt, he goes through the Red Sea. So he parts the Red Sea, either or, and he goes through it. The Egyptians, being representing the world, couldn't part the either or. They couldn't get through the double bind. You see. So mythology is full of this. Noah's Ark. What does he Noah's the Ark is the world, and what does he put on the world? But pairs of opposites. So he puts all the pairs of opposites, the either or, either male or female, puts all the pairs of opposites in one ark, boat. So he makes this is a myth mythological way of saying that. The, you get, you know, a two becoming one. The incompatible pair of opposites becoming one. So what, what we're interested in here is how do we get, and the way, you see, is one. Uh, how, do, how do we get to one when we are in a world of two? So you pointed to the answer when you said there was a creative element to this. Um, so how do we get to the creative solution? Uh, now one thing about creativity, if you, uh, you know, and everybody has experienced creativity, whether it's on a big scale or a small scale, but creativity is an act. Uh, that is going to be spontaneous. Now, you can't will creativity any more than you can will love. Like, you can't make yourself be creative. You know, it's called, you know, the writers call it the writer's block. You know, like I'm sitting here looking at a blank page. You know, and I can't make, I can't find a creative word. I can't find my word. There's another idea, the word. Okay, so Jesus says, I am the Word. Okay. And then he says, I am the Word made flesh. All right, so if the Word is God and man is flesh, so then Jesus is the Word made flesh. Now, if the Word is, cre if the word is remember, the king, remember the movie, the, uh, the King's Speech? Yeah. Okay, that was about the Word. That was about, he stuttered, okay, but I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be. <laughs> like, like, what, who's the card, the Elmer Fudd? <laughs> you know, so he stuttered, his word was broke, broken, and no matter how he tried to speak his word, he couldn't, so he was caught in a double bind. You can't, he can't, he discovered he can't try to speak his word. The more he tried, the more he stuttered. Stutter is fine then. I mean, this is a common thing. The more I try to not stutter, I stutter. So how do I let go of trying? <laughs> but still speak my word. See the double bind there? I must speak my word, but I can't try to do it. But if I don't try to do it, I'll never speak it. Try to be good. Well, I have to be good, but if I try to be good, I'll be bad. Then I have to try to be good because I have to be good. <laughs> da da da. You know we can find. So what we're interested here is is understanding the pattern. So when the so if our lives are like a river, and we come upon conditions create, maybe with the spouse or with the boss or with the clerk at Walmart, or with whatever we run into conditions. Conditions create the pattern of the double bind. If I see the pattern, I can say, wait, oh, look at this. We were, I was in class and we were talking about a double bind. And here's one right here, you know. 
I see the pattern. Isn't that interesting? You see? So you notice, see, the pattern is that if you don't see the pattern, you're caught in the pattern. If you don't see the pattern, you're the, you're the water in the whirlpool. But if you see the pattern, in that one moment that you see the pattern, here's the whirlpool, here's the river in it, you see. But when you see the pattern, awareness awakens, and you're on the riverbank seeing the pattern while you're in it. See that? When you see the pattern, you can't be in the pattern. If you don't see the pattern, you're in it, and that's it. Then you're going to have to go all the way until it spits you out. And then you're going to come out of the whirlpool and say, oh, man, I'm not going to do that. What, what the hell was that, you know? One, one minute I was just having a normal conversation with this person, the next thing you know, we're having a food fight. What was that? You see, well, there we go. That was... <laughs> Condition for a right, my conditions, the person's conditions. Everything was peaceful, we're having a nice kind of next thing, we're mad at each other, yelling or whatever, uh, and vowing never to come back, you know, all that stuff. You see, we get spit out on the, on the bank here. <laughs> you, know, what, uh, you know, what was that? There's, there's a, a, one story I love, a, a yoga story, is about the uh, master and his disciple, and they're walking along the river, and uh, the disciple says, uh, Master, tell me what Maya means. Maya. Well, this, this means uh, the illusion of the world in Eastern traditions. Well, it's very simple to see. When I was coming up here on 288, and I turned prematurely, I was in Maya. In other words, I wasn't present in the road, seeing the road where I was, aware of the, car, the contact. I was in an alternative mind reality, which was our conversation, or I could, I could have been daydreaming. That's a Maya. It's an illusion. It's not the real, the real world is the road you're driving on, you see. Not where you think you are. So anyway, the master disciple says, well, the master says, oh, you want to know what Maya is? Well, I'll tell you what Maya is, but first, I'm thirsty. Would you get me some water? So the disciple says, certainly. So he goes running to this, uh, I guess there was a bridge. I don't know. He crosses it. He goes over to a farmhouse uh, to get some water. And, and uh, the farmer comes there, and, and uh, he has a beautiful daughter. And uh, he says he could have some water. But first, he says, I'll give you some water, but I need some help with the something on the farm here. Uh, could you help me for a minute? He says, sure. And so the farmer needs help, and the, he falls in love with the daughter, and they get married, and they have children. They have their own farm and everything. And uh, there is a great monsoon, and there's a huge flood, and they're all swept up in the river. And he's, the daughter goes, the wife goes, and they're all gone. And he ends up on the riverbank, half dead. And he looks up, and there's the master saying, uh, where is my water? So he didn't tell him what Maya was. He showed him what Maya was. You see. So all that, <laughs> the daughter, the farmhouse, the family, the whole thing was um, the illusion of the world, which is our human mind, caught up in all these great choices we're making, <laughs> you see, to uh, uh, that, that creates history. So awareness is not in history or time. Now just, just digest this for a minute. So if we're looking at our life as being a river of changing form, we're all, our bodies, are all, all the cells in our body seven years ago were all the cells that we had in our body seven years ago are gone, so our body died physically because everything that was in it seven years ago is all gone. You see, we have created new cells. But on every level, everything is changing like river water, okay? 
So, and we swim in this. And we're trying to navigate through choices in, the, in a river of life, depending on what conditions create for us. You know, one minute, you know, we're always in changing conditions. You see, if I go, whenever we leave here, the world is, it's like gonna, you know, it's like the world is changing, you know, the cars are changing. Uh, we don't know what this car is gonna do. If I have a wreck, it's because this other car was doping off and he was daydreaming about something and he was daydreaming because uh, somebody uh, uh, hurt him at work and that person that hurt him at work was daydreaming because he got hurt here. And uh, if you start investigating conditions, so uh, you can't stop. It's everything is conditioning everything else. So it's a vast interconnected field of conditions in which we, <laughs> you see, as a little self, is trying to navigate by making choices. And half the time we're not making choices because things are done. If I'm driving along perfectly well and somebody hits me, I didn't make a choice to hit him. Yet I did choose to be there. I didn't choose to go over this way. You see, I chose to go this way, so I meet with the guy who's doping off and hits me. So I can say, well, why did that happen? It's his fault. Well, I chose to be here. I could have chosen over here. I could have chose to stay late. You see, so you can't find any single cause for anything. You can, you can select something if this is the best cause I can find, but it's not the total cause, you see. But anyway, so this... So this, this whirlpool of the river, you see, is time and its form. And everything is moving in its own little patterns. See, every life is a set of patterns. So we, we have um, little, you know, every, my, I choose to go here, I choose to go there, uh, creates ripples, other people have to get out of my way, uh, you know, everything I'm causing, other things to happen by everything I do. So what I do is going to be conditioned by the way I have done things in the past, my preferences, my likes and dislikes, my prejudices, you see, all of these things, my religion, everything I hold is me, conditions me the way to the way I'm going to move in the world, you see, so there's a conditioning. So there's these conditions, uh, conditioning, conditionings um, forever. And this is, you could say, is the world. Of time and form. You see, it's in time, it's in space, it's here, but it's changing. Now the moment I see a double binding pattern, which I notice is a pattern because it repeats itself. It's like deja vu. I just like coming coming here. You see, I I, uh, um, I notice that the uh, missing the turn. I've done it before, and once you do something once, if you do it again, you've got a pattern. <laughs> if you don't recognize the pattern, you're going to do it a third time. And each time you do it, it gets stronger because you are investing in that pattern. So if we have a patterned way of doing things, we've done it all our life, that's a pretty strong pattern. But we can create a new pattern and find ourselves doing that again. Um, so the noticing of the pattern cannot be done from within the pattern. See, I'm aware of myself in the pattern as a separate me, either being uh, caught, you see, in the pattern. And I notice I'm in a pattern because of the pain. You know, the pain can be subtle, just a little feeling of uh, not quite being here, like this morning with the crossroad, you know, with my, with my wanting, wife wanting to engage me in the word of the day, <laughs> the crossword puzzle, and I'm halfway doing it, but I'm not fully there with it, you see, I'm kind of like split, and I feel the pain of not being totally engaged with her as she wants me to be, I'm kind of a hypocrite, 
You see, I'm pretending to be engaged, but there's a part of me that's really just disengaged. And it wasn't that I wanted to be somewhere else. It was just holding back. I wasn't just jumping. She was all into that crossword. <laughs> and I was like 50%. And so there's a part of me holding back, you see. This is a pattern, my pattern. This is a pattern. Um, so this, this, uh, so there's a pain in that, you see, because when I hold back, or I wish I was somewhere else, or I'm daydreaming while they're talking to me, I'm off somewhere thinking that, you see, I have created this, you see. I'm here and I'm not here. I want my cake and I'll eat it too. <laughs> I want to eat the moment, but I don't want to be here. That kind of, you know, so we have to see that. <laughs> And so we can see the pattern. So when I see the pattern, the seer the seer of the pattern is who I am. Now what I'm suggesting, and this, uh, this is what you have to discover yourself, you see, is that this is the way of Jesus and the Buddha were pointing to. It's the, it's the way of seeing the, uh, if you want to put it in, in uh, Christian terms, you, it's, the, it's the way of seeing the sin of the world. In other words, the sin of the world is the sin of being asleep in the world. So in that sense, uh, when I missed the turn coming up to Midlothian by, by prematurely turning and taking the wrong choice, I was uh, not remembering uh, the, the uh, presence or awakening. I was remembering my sin of forgetfulness. I was forgetting the present moment and making the wrong turn. But then I remembered, <laughs> you see, that I was making the wrong turn while I was making it. Not after I made the wrong turn and got five miles down the road. I remembered making the wrong turn as I begin, just as I began to make it, so I was able to recorrect and get back on the road, you see. So th there's a lot of different ways of looking at this, and the, and the problem is that, um, maybe not the problem is that if we want to make the teaching of Jesus applicable to my everyday life, we have to understand it in a different context, which is more psychological uh, instead of mythological. Like Jesus is God and he'll save me if I just pay my dues, you see. Uh, in other words, I am my own, in this context here, I, the Savior is me. The Savior is my awareness that sees the pattern while I'm in the pattern. So this is really what Jesus says, be in the world and not of the world. I am both in the world, I'm in the pattern, but I'm not of the pattern. I'm outside the pattern, seeing the pattern as I do it. And the seeing of it liberates me from the power. I immediately correct myself. When you see that you're caught in a double bind pattern, the seeing of it is the action that frees you from the pattern. Because we don't continue to hurt ourselves when we're aware that we're doing it. In other words, uh, um, you know, I don't want to get into masochism here where somebody, you know, that's a whole other thing. But I mean, if I see that my hand is on a hot plate, I take it off. I don't have to think about it. I see it. So when I see the pattern that's causing me pain, the seeing liberates me from, and the pattern falls off because the pattern's not real. 
You see, the pattern comes from conditioning, you see. So the seeing of it liberates me from it, and that opens up love and being at home. And it's creative. Life is creative. So it opens, and so then I know what to do. If I don't, if I'm not in the pattern, I'm going to do something, but what I do is not going to be part of the pattern. So what I do is going to be now, because now is always creating itself. Life is always creating itself. So I'm back in alignment with life and whatever life needs when I see the patterns that have held me captive to repeating the past. And this all has to be <clears throat> discovered and not learned. I mean, we just have to, uh, and, and like I said before, the advantage of our age is that uh, our lives are a lot simpler. We're not dealing with great cosmic choices, whatever. We can deal with um, life at a uh, more manageable level, and I can notice the patterns when I'm not even paying attention to what I'm eating. You know, that's you know, very simple. Uh, uh, just, just, uh, so basically we have to, there have to, going back to the communion table at the church, it says, in remembrance of me. So from this context, when we say in remembrance of me, I'm re I want to remember my own self. <laughs> it's not somebody else I want to remember. I want to remember my own awareness that I am. So as we go through the life of double binds, and splits and neurosis and all of the conflicts you see, there's always this ever-present call to remember to see the pattern here and not be caught up in the illusion that we can get out of the pattern by making a better choice this time. See, we're always, when the pattern returns, it always comes back with new clothes so we don't recognize it. We might be in another city, another town, with another person, another situation. The situation is always changing, but the pattern is the same. But we don't see the pattern because we think the situation has never happened before, and this is brand new, and so I'm caught in it again. And who's to blame for that? Well, the, the person or the situation is to blame, you see. Or I'm to blame. But nobody's to blame for the pattern, you see. Because the pattern is, is the world we live in. I mean, it's just all kinds of, everybody's acting out their own patterns, blaming the pain of the pattern on somebody else or themselves, which is self-incrimination. Thank you. I needed that. Yeah. <laughs> I needed that. Yeah, when we're caught in the pattern, we got to blame somebody for it. Yeah. And it's either going to be the other or me. It can't be, there's no other choice. I was thinking about the word suppression. You know what suppression is when you suppress your thoughts? Yeah. Or repression, I guess, yeah. is a deeper way right. to form of the same thing. Yeah. Well, in my home, I grew up, and there was a lot of screaming and yelling. So in order to, to endure that, I yeah. would suppress it. And I thought that that's where it started. But from the house I grew up in, and I it, you know, just suppress everything. Like, it's not that, it's the pattern, but it's, I formed the pattern in myself. Right? Yeah, well, it's survive, it's, for survival, so there's nothing wrong with for it. For survival, right? And yeah. That's how it, it's going. Yeah, the problem is we form a pattern for survival, but then conditions change, and we're no longer living with the parent, but the pattern remains. Yeah, so right. now I live in the world emotionally as if I was still living with my parents. You see, so the pattern is a feeling-based pattern, not an intellectual-based pattern. The, the thinking, I'm not back, I'm done, you know, I'm not back home, I'm a grown person. That's stupid, you see. But I feel, <laughs> I feel like I'm still back there, you see. So there's a split now between thinking what I think is going on and what I feel is going on. And this, you see, is split between mine and body. See, body is feelings 
mind is thinking, and in our culture, and in Christianity, this gets split because in Christianity said, well, to see the body is flesh, right? And mind is kind of like spirit, right? So we, you know, we're told the commandment is, you know, turn away from the flesh because it's fallen and point to the idea of spirit, <laughs> the idea of God. So I got I to gotta turn towards the idea of God which is still my idea, and turn away from feeling. So now I should be doing this, but I feel like doing that. And addiction, drugs, everything is like that. I really want to smoke this cigarette, but I shouldn't. <laughs> and the more I fight, the more I repress the body, the more it builds up until one day uh, you're sitting there thinking you beat the habit and somebody puts a cigarette down there and you're talking and the next thing you know, you're smoking it. <laughs> what the hell? You know, you know, and now you're back in the pattern. And now it's twice as hard to quit because now you don't trust yourself. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so this pattern, you know, that just constantly goes on, you know, this constant fight between the mind. So the, my word, you see, my word is where these two Body, mind, or together, you know, and, and we instinctively, we call, when somebody's body and mind is one, we call them authentic. They're not speaking with a split tongue. You see, they, uh, you know, they just, that's one reason why Trump is popular, because he, oh, he speaks what he, th he speaks his mind. Well, that basically means he's not reading a script. <laughs> It doesn't mean he's good or bad, you see. It just means he's, he's uh, uh, just speaking spontaneously. He, he just gets up and speaks his word, you see. But that does has nothing to do with what kind of president we make. And it's more or less what makes him attractive. Uh, so this whole idea of when body and mind come together, and... Um, uh, has, has a lot of dimensions to it because it's, it's all about healing, basically. Healing the split in my own life and in the, ex in the world outside, you see. Make America whole again, make America great again, basically is a means make America one again. And that goes on both candidates. Sanders is saying that, and Trump is saying that. They're all saying that. He's not saying making the whole. He's no, he's making it great. great. <laughs> but that means the same thing. Again. It means it means America. It means what what they're all saying is that America speaks with one word. When America speaks, everybody trembles. <laughs> you know, when America speaks, uh, the world listens. You know, but that basically that is uh, see. But Trump, you know, but that. That's what we all want. <laughs> you know, it's not, um, you know, so this is all externalized us. You see, the, the American people uh, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have become because of our technology that we have invented, which is called media. Media is an American invention. We invent TV, uh, internet, smartphones, the whole thing uh, is image. Getting back to Don Draper and Mad Men, which I hope you all watch, is about on one level, one dimension of it, is the study of how America lives in the image of themselves instead of being authentically themselves. When we live in an image, the image is a product of the mind. The image does not include the body because the body is now, feeling now, image, you see, is an abstraction of a reality, so it's separate from now. So we can live in image forever, 
<laughs> we can take refuge in the image because the image is not real. It's an image. So we, we live because of our conditioning. Um, and this is why, you know, we, we began as a, as a farming, agrarian society, and farmers, people that live on the land, are grounded in manure. I mean, they're grounded in life and death, killing the chicken themselves, <laughs> you know. You fix it yourself, you're grounded in the earth and the seasons, you know. And then you move to the city and you're grounded in the image. You know, you lose touch with the earth. This is all about, you know, rednecks in the south and the whole thing. The, the, you know, the farmers are real people. <laughs> City people are latte drinking elite, you know. <laughs> Liberals. <laughs> They've lost touch with reality and the ground. It's, all this is politicized. But the whole idea. I'm, I guess I, I've lived a life of hypocrisy. And, uh, I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself constantly one saying, when I retire, these are the things I want to do. And I've done nothing. Yeah. None of them. Almost none of them. <laughs> I wish this, but I don't do that. Yeah. And there are many reasons why. I'm trying to justify those reasons, I think. And one of the things I really wish out of meditation <clears throat> some kind of answer to let me accept the way I am, yet do better all the time. Then sometimes I come to this terrible conclusion that habit is what? Is it one? Is, is this happiness and innocence and love and purity? Is that heaven? If that's heaven, what else is there? Really? I mean, <laughs> what is this? It's hell, I guess, but, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, well, right, so if I did everything right and I got to heaven, then I'm just... Well, all right, so zero. Jesus is always talking about the kingdom. Earth, yeah. Well, he's all, all right, so Jesus is always talking about the kingdom. That's no place yeah. here on the earth. Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of heaven is here, but you can't see it. Over and over, that's in different ways of things. He says, you know, it's not there in time. It's not in time. That's it's here. It's yeah. Yeah, well then that, you know, so then, yeah, but so this, this is the way it gets, tri see, the problem is that the teaching of Jesus is you're not able to practice, do it in the world. So when the church comes along and takes these teachings, it puts it in a framework that distorts the teaching of Jesus because this teaching is impossible to do if you try to do it. Try to love God, you know, with all your heart and mind. You know, you can't do it. <laughs> you can pretend or deceive yourself, you see, but you can't make yourself love anybody. So, the, so the the prop, so you got a problem here. So how do we make a religion out of something that you can't do? Well, it gets translated in. Well, heaven is not here. It's. <laughs> You know, do good now, try the best you can, and you, you'll be rewarded, you get to heaven. And heaven is where you'll be home. So your authentic life now is put off into heaven. So the only way to get these, so the only way out of it is to die. So, you know, why not just, why not just shoot yourself now? Thanks. <laughs> And people do, you know, in these seven day, not seven day, group, but end of world people put this in a cosmic framework. So the end of world is coming in time, and it's almost here now because Obama's been elected. So we need to, so we need to bring it on, right? And you know, and then you get, well, it's going to happen in Israel, so we need to bring on a big war with Israel and all that, you know. You know, in other words, we got to encourage the end of time now. Is about you know this the rap bring the rapture on. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to get with Jesus after the rapture, and I know I'm going there because uh, I believe you know the whole thing is basically um, uh, uh, kind of like a collective suicide or death wish <laughs> or death wish. You know, I want to bring on bring on the end so I can get rid of the pain. You see what I mean? I want to get rid of the pain of 
the double bind of not being able to live in heaven now. In other words, if I can't be in heaven now, I gotta wait until I'm dead to get to heaven. Well, then obviously uh, I'm, I'm like in prison. I'm just doing my time now until when I can get to heaven. You know, it's kind of like, you know, staying in the Navy for 20 years. I didn't want it. <laughs> you know, uh, so you, you know, or, or working your whole life so you can retire. And as soon as you retire, you have a heart attack. Because <laughs> you worked your whole life. <laughs> You're miserable. Yeah, so, but it getting to what you, you know, so what you're looking at there is a pattern that is a double bind out of which you can't get. Because the pattern is that you're not satisfied with yourself as you are, you should be doing something else, you see. But if you did something else, you would, the pattern would still activate and you should, maybe I should be doing more. Or maybe I should have been doing that, you see. So the pattern is what you want revealed to you in the meditation. So that requires a stillness. The seer is still. But what the, see, the stillness is aware of is movement, thinking. So thinking is movement of thought forms in time. Stillness is the still awareness that is not moving. If it's moving, you can't, you're, it's relativity. You see this like Einstein talking about relativity. So if, you, if I'm on the earth and it's moving in space, and I'm looking at the, uh, uh, another planet that's moving in space, we're both moving. There's no, you know, so I don't know, everything I know about this planet's movement is based on my movement and I don't know what my movement is, you see, so I don't know what I'm looking at, <laughs> you see. Because, so, so if, the only way to see the true movement would be if I were aware, if I were outside of it, you see then I could be aware of the, the true movement of the two objects. But I can't get outside of it because I'm part of the object. See, so, but awareness of thinking is not thinking. So if you sit, when we sit in meditation, we're just constantly letting go of the effort to meditate, constantly letting go, discovering the pattern of trying. So the more every, trying is a pattern to get out of the pain of trying. Trying is painful because we want to be where different than what we are. So the pain that we're trying to get out of comes from the trying to get out of the pain. So medita all meditation is basically seeing that in its different forms. So the, when we see that, we let go of it. So we're constantly evolving towards stillness. And the more we evolve towards stillness, the more aware we become of the patterns of our life, and the freer we become from the pain of life. And this is what Buddha talks about when he says old age, sickness, and death. So the way is to be free, is the freedom from old age, sickness, and death, which doesn't mean the physical death of the body, because all bodies die. It is the way that live, the, is the cessation of the suffering of the double binding patterns in which we get caught up in, because they're not real. You see. But this is all about personal discovery. It's not about reading about it and learning it and, and uh, remembering it and everything. When you say in remembrance of me, in this context, in remembrance of me is basically doing me. <laughs> and who is me when Jesus says, well, 
I am uh, that I am. In other words, Jesus is the seer. So Jesus Christ is not out there in history or up there in the heavens, you see. It is in me as me. But not as a form. You don't go around saying, I'm Jesus. But when you see the pattern, you're seeing through the eye of Jesus. Because Jesus, you see, Christ would be outside of the world as the awareness of the world, but at the same time he's in it. So here again, we kind of like solve this puzzle here. So Jesus Christ is God. He is outside of the world as the seer, but he's also in the world as the man. So that's who we are, you see. We're both outside of the world as the seer of the world, the patterns of the world, and we're in it. But the me that's in it, you see, is not who I am. So when the me that's in it goes, I am still here. But not as a me. So I really haven't gone anywhere. So if I see the pattern, I've really died to, for that instant, I've died to the me that's caught in the pattern, that believes itself to be the pattern. So, um, you know, you can play that back to the crucifixion. The crucifixion is me in the pattern of the world, suffering, and the resurrection is the eye that sees the suffering of the world. It's not in it, you see. So the, these really come together. It's not like they're two separate things. The seeing of the patterns we're caught in is the resurrection and the liberation from the cross of being caught home, you see, on the patterns. Well, you all really hung in here with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, because I didn't know where, how we were going to work this out. Uh, it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, I start out with this, you know, how do you, how does, how, this is a paradox. So we've been working at trying to understand the paradox, which is who we are. We're all a paradox. We just can't be pinned down. <laughs> it's hard for me to picture that we're here, uh, a relatively educated population in a world that is full of everything where you can eat an orange in class and, and have a McDonald's or whatever. Yeah. These thoughts originally, I mean, I wonder how many populations there were before this that had nothing. I mean, you lived on an island and come up with ideas. The people were thinking these things. I mean, the law of what's in the mind. Yeah. And the, the, how have we evolved from that? When you think back thousands of years, right. uh, they still had some of these basic wishes and desires. We haven't gotten the answer. Well, I look at it, you know, I look, you know, having studied this, you know, look, it's like um, you have a pond. The, the world is like a, a soup <laughs> and evolution. There's, you know, there's a pond, there's mud and water and stuff, and life starts, somehow evolves out of it, single cells, you know, and they evolve. And all of the evolution is, is becoming greater and greater holes. I mean, you start out with, uh, you know, Little, little cells, you know, and they form into bigger cells, and then you get fish, and then you get lizards, and then you get bigger, and then you get mammals, and little ones, and you get dinosaurs, and then it all evolves into greater and greater holes. You see, so finally the conditions are ready for man to evolve. So he didn't evolve until the conditions were ready. You see, so we don't evolve. This is all evolution of consciousness. See, so if we're caught in the patterns, I'm at a particular stage of my evolution. And as soon as I have an insight into the pattern, I have just made the great leap of mankind. You see, I have just, that same light of insight is the same light that lit Buddha up in Jesus. <laughs> the light's the same. But the conditions have to be there for the light to 
be created. So each one of us, you see, goes through the, whether you believe in reincarnation or not, it doesn't, you know, uh, but we're all in the same conditions, and if we have the intention to awaken, to see the suffering in the conditions of my life, then we are following the way of the Buddha and Christ, you see. Because all of them went through the same stages. So it's the awakening of the light of awareness. And that doesn't matter if it's the Roman times or if it's back in Egypt. Or, you know, the world's the same. You see, so the, the world exists to create the conditions for the awakening of awareness. So you don't awaken unless there's a dream. So it doesn't make any difference what time in history you're in. It's all asleep anyway. <laughs> Everybody is in a pattern. It's called karma. So every human <coughs> being is caught up in the karma of their life. I mean, they're in the illusion of Maya, like the disciple who goes and gets the water and forgets being the water and goes off into his life history, and then suddenly, boom, he's right back <laughs> where he was before, and he realizes that he's been caught up in a dream. And the dream has attractions, you see. Oh, you're going to be at home, you're going to get all this stuff and all this, you see. So we go in it, and we create it, and we live in it, uh, until death gets close. <laughs> and when death starts knocking, you see, we start, you know, It'll wake us up. <laughs> you, know, you know, so the, the, the one thing that Maya and the illusion of the world cannot integrate is death. Death does not fit in. You know, so death is out here. You see. And this is why people don't meditate, is because when you get really still and awareness begins to open, the thinking me begins to get weaker and insignificant. And to the thinking me, that's death. The thinking me wants to be strong and think about stuff. And think it's way out of things. But it's so temporary. Huh? That death is so temporary because when you come out of meditation, you are so much more aware and thoughtful and everything. So if we can understand that that death during meditation is yeah. very temporary, People will be able to yeah. meditate. Yeah, I, you know, and um, you know, the, you know, to to the thinking mind, death becomes something uh, un incomprehensible, or something that we don't want to go to. You see, uh, but death is just stillness. I mean, if you go to you know a funeral home and, and you look at a corpse, there is nothing more still than a dead person. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're stiller than the table. <laughs> you know, they're more still than, you know, anything. You know, it's just, we, 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 we connect with that. Because that same stillness, you see, is in us. Mm -hmm. So we're already dead. <laughs> By framing death as absolute stillness, which is awareness. You see, the West, in our paradigm, says that consciousness and thinking in the mind is created by the brain. But the brain is matter. So the brain dies. The brain is determined by conditions. If you drink Flint water, <laughs> your brain's going to you know, your brain's gonna, uh, be damaged by the water. So then your consciousness is going to be affected by the brain's damage by the um, lead in the water, you see. But not awareness. So in, in the Western paradigm, there is no place for awareness that is outside of form. So we have to go to the East, a yoga, Advaita, the non-dual systems of the East, in order to discover <coughs> a teaching that creates the possibility for awareness to bloom. See, if you don't believe it's there, it's not going to happen. The conditions are not right. 
So this practice of meditation and these Dharma talks and all this basically is creating the understanding which will create the conditions so our essential awareness will pop through the pattern as insight. Oh, I see. And when we see, everything integrates and has meaning because there's no split. There's no either or and I'm confused and I'm lost and all that. You see, everything for that moment is one. You know, and then, of course, we'll go back into two and confusion and all that, but then we discover one again. And every time we discover one, we discover our <coughs> essential wholeness, and we're okay. When you're whole and home, you're okay. So that heals, oneness heals the split of a self that's two, that's in conflict with itself. I should be doing something else, but I can't or don't want to do that. Or you look in the mirror and say, I should look like the magazine picture. Or look at the wrinkles now, I'm getting old, and I used to be young, you know. Well, you know, there is no you that used to be young. You're just who you are right now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> there is no you that got older. You know, there's just you right now. <laughs> and you're okay. Anyway, thank you all so much.